Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Nightingale 2020 virtual conference. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this two day virtual 2020 conference and welcome to day one. So my name is Greta Westwood and I'm the chief executive of this amazing nursing and midwifery charity, the Florence Nightingale Foundation. So of course this year is the year of the nurse and midwife, 2020, Florence Nightingale's bicentenary. Well, golly, what a year. It's certainly not the year that we'd all planned for. And it's not the conference that we had planned. Um, I really had hoped to be addressing 4,000 nurses and midwives together in a huge conference, conference facility in London. Instead, I'm welcoming each one of you, a nurse or midwife from around the world, and I'm almost certain, certainly speaking to you in each of your own homes. What a, what a difference that is for the, for the conference that we had planned. So this slide shows the full programme and all the wonderful speakers over the next two days. I particularly would like to take this opportunity to welcome all the keynote speakers, the panel chairs, the panel, panellists, and those nurses and midwives who submit an abstract, and we've chosen their work to present today and tomorrow. I thank you for all your support for the foundation, your time commitment to make this conference a success. And we've designed the program so it's a mixture of keynote speeches, panel sessions and spoken presentations. There are 38 spoken presentations which have been pre-recorded as videos and they will be available throughout the, the next two days. And the presentations are really far are from an international group of high quality presenters demonstrating the innovation, the research and the theory development that has been led by nurses and midwives across, across the globe. And we're really excited that we're able to showcase and promote their work in this way. And then after the conference, you will have the opportunity of um, accessing the, the conference um, spoken presentations through our YouTube link. And this will be available to you all. And we encourage you to use this, these links and share their work with all your networks. So today we've come together to share our nursing and midwifery knowledge, our vast experience from all the corners of the world. This map shows the countries of origin. Um, I'd like to say a special thank you for those of you who've stayed up very late to join us, our delegates from Eastern Australian time, and those of you who had very early state start to your day, those on West Coast line, uh, West Coast time, and, and also those on, 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 on the East Coast of the USA. So thank you so much for um, staying up late and getting up early. Um, your, your support is amazing. Thank you. So the next slide um, is, the, is our sponsors. So we are so proud to announce the conference is being supported by the Burdett Trust for, for Nursing. The Burdett Trust for Nursing has been a loyal supporter of the foundation for many years. And um, as a foundation, as a, it gives charitable grants for nurse-led projects across the UK. So the plans for this conference started in January 2017. I can't believe it was that long ago. Um, and again, with a very generous support of, from the Burdett Trust, for which the foundation and indeed the whole nursing community is very grateful. Um, a UK-wide steering group was established to ensure the programme was a global conference and it would definitely be remembered in Florence's bicentenary. But of course, that all came to a halt when the coronav uh, coronavirus pandemic struck the world. So at the time of cancelling the conference, we had nearly over 500 conference abstracts that had been submitted. And we could have easily decided it was too difficult to organise a virtual conference or delay it for a number of entirely valid reasons, given the current situation across the world. But we didn't, we didn't want to lose the intellectual content of the effort that had been spent in submitting those abstracts. And we wanted to give nurses and midwives everywhere the opportunity to come together and learn. So once again, with special thanks to the Burdett Trust for Nursing, we have transferred the conference into this virtual platform, albeit not the whole platform, the whole programme as we'd originally planned. Florence was born in 19, uh, died in 1910. And at that time, the international nursing community um, decided that they'd like to establish a living memorial for her work. Ethel Fennick, um, pictured here, 
was the, the, the nurse that originally proposed the idea at the ICN Congress in 1929. And eventually the Florence Nightingale Foundation was established thereafter um, in, in Great Britain. And we've been supporting nurses and midwives since 1934. So, the Florence Nightingale Foundation had planned quite a celebration this year. May the 12th marked her bicentenary and we'd had scheduled a host of activities. And no doubt those celebrations would have been repeated across the world um, by nurses and midwives everywhere. Uh, the World Health Organization had designated the year of the nurse and the midwife. Um, but whilst we paused our events, Really, I'm sure everybody would agree that 2020 has nonetheless been absolutely the year of the nurse and the midwife, a year when every nurse and midwife was called to support the COVID-19 pandemic. What dedication, honour, and in some case, the ultimate sacrifice had been given to nurses and midwives. So um, the celebrations would be repeated by nurses and midwives across the world. So excited about 2020, the World Health Organization designated year in the nurse and midwife. But it's been a formidable year. It's been a year, year that nobody had, had even thought about. And as I said, what dedication, honor, um, and some case the ultimate sacrifice that we've seen as our professions courageously keep our population safe. And I'm delighted that 2020 will be a continu continu continuation of that important year, a time when we can truly honour our nurses and midwives celebrating Florence Nighting Nightingale's bicentenary. And we will therefore be continuing her, her legacy we got beyond 2020. So one, some of you might be wondering why we still celebrate Florence's worth, work. What, you know, what is it that is still relevant 160 years ago? Why is she still relevant today? So some of you may know, but today, 166 years ago, Florence was in transit to care for the ill and the injured soldiers in the Crimean War. She left London with 38 nurses on the 21st of October, 1854, and she arrived here in barracks and Skatari barracks on um, the 4th of November in Turkey. So what did she do that was so, that was so, rele is so relevant today? But uh, and I'm going to suggest that the the relevance is absolutely striking. So hands, if we think about um, what we're doing right now, she, Florence used the data to influence the political power base in the UK, and she negotiated the improved conditions for our soldiers. Her famous po polar chart, which you can see behind my shoulder, provided the mortality date rate evidence. Soldiers were dying not in the battle wounds, but of, of their infectious diseases. Florence understood that washing, washing hands was the first principle of infection prevention and control and famously said, every nurse ought to be careful to wash their hands very frequently during the day if her, if her face too, so much the better. So about space, what did she do um, about this famous two metre space that we know so well now? So when Florence arrived in Scutari, she was appalled at the, at the conditions in which the soldiers were expected to recover from their injuries. Men lay on the cold, wet earth of work, makeshift floors of overcrowded rooms, often in their own filth. There were no supplies to manage the thousands of soldiers who needed attention, not even clean dressings. She immediately established the barracks as a hospital. Beds, when they arrived, were placed at a safe distance from each other, and so limiting the risk of cross-infection. The design of the, this hospital, the Nightingale Ward System, again seen in this, in this slide, has been repeated across the world and is seen most recently in the build of the NHS Nightingale Hospitals um, during the uh, coronavirus pandemic. So Florence um, certainly developed the role of the professional nurse and she sparked worldwide health reform through her avid interest in data and evidence. As a pioneer and leader in public health, it's fitting her legacy has been used to shine a light on nurses and midwives. So we continue to celebrate the Florence, the pioneer, the statistician, the influencer, the hospital architect, the trailblazer, who refused not to take, who refused to take no for an answer. Florence's, Florence's early work in, in infection prevention and control still remain, remains our practice today, as we strive to save thousands of people around the world. Today and tomorrow, we want to shine a light on the work of nurses and midwives, demonstrating the leadership roles and impact nurses and midwives make across the world. I would like to shine a light on the work of the foundation has been doing since April this year to support nurses and midwives in COVID-19 frontline. 
This service we've called Nightingale Frontline. And this video you're about to see, nobody's seen before, so you are its exclusive audience. Thank you. The Florence Nightingale Foundation exists to develop the leadership potential of nurses and midwives, empowering them with the confidence and courage to influence policy and help change the world of healthcare for the better. We provide year-long scholarships for nurses and midwives, as well as a range of bespoke leadership programs in collaboration with our partners. Since March 2020, all of health and social care has been affected and disrupted by COVID-19. Understanding the impact that this pandemic would have on nurses and midwives, we created the Nightingale Frontline Leadership Support Service, a brand new program designed to offer some socially distanced, emotional and well-being support, both during and after the crisis. During the sessions, Groups of six nurses or midwives come together in virtual meetings with a trained facilitator. Each of them becomes a coach, a client and a peer, and at times they just listen to the others. From the first weeks of the pandemic, the groups proved to be an extremely powerful space for nurses and midwives to find their own solutions to their own issues. As a foundation working to continue the legacy of Florence Nightingale, we felt a responsibility to share with the world the themes, experiences and lessons that emerged. While it wasn't everywhere, in many places, under the guise of crisis management, a hierarchy of command and control was seen as essential to manage the COVID-19 response. Senior leaders issued policy from the top down, while nurses and midwives felt ignored and undervalued. To make matters worse, many were moved to different clinical areas, cutting them off from the colleagues that they knew and trusted, their wider support networks and their normal routines. This culture of sudden change led to resentment and low morale, which in turn brought out disruptive behaviours from frontline staff, meaning even the best policies were received with scepticism and mistrust. One of the key themes that came out of the Nightingale Frontline Leadership Programme was courage. And we identified six forms of courage enacted by nurses and midwives at all levels of the NHS that enabled parts of the organisation to move away from command and control and towards a more collective leadership. The first is authenticity the courage to make a commitment to share genuine emotion and respond genuinely to our colleagues' emotions. The second is transparency, the courage to share openly what was known and crucially what was not known about how to respond to the virus. The third is uncertainty, the courage to continue to do the next right thing and the best we can with our incomplete knowledge. The fourth is the courage to challenge, advocate and question. The best decisions are usually made by those closest to the problem. To work, new policies and processes need to be able to be challenged from the ground up. The fifth is the courage to be vulnerable. This means being a role model and demonstrating rather than describing positive behaviour sometimes even showing vulnerability so that those around us know that it's okay to prioritize self-care and ask for support. Last on our list is the courage to communicate, to be unafraid to tell the truth, even when it's difficult for people to hear. No one understands frontline care like the nurses and midwives who administer it. 
To ignore this invaluable resource in our strategic decision making is a phenomenal and negligent waste. At the Florence Nightingale Foundation, we want every nurse and midwife to be empowered to make their voice heard, to share what they know and lead by example, no matter who they are or what position they hold. If you're interested in attending one of our Nightingale Frontline Leadership Sessions, would like to contribute to our work, or would just like to find out more about what we do, please visit our website today. Thank you. So you are the first viewers of that, that video highlighting the work that we've been doing since um, the coronavirus lockdown. Um, just a, a little bit of the work we've been doing, but I think it was really important to show that today. Um, as delegates of this conference, um, we'd like to give you the exclusive offer of um, a virtual tour of the France Nightingale Museum. Um, over the over the, the beginning, so since this year started in 2020, the museum has set up, set up a, 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 a collection of 200 objects, highlight, highlighting the role of Florence and the nursing profession over the last um, 160 years. But obviously since lockdown, the museum hasn't fully been um, operational. And um, for the benefit of the delegates today, they've developed a short 10 minute video highlighting, detailing Florence's life. Um, and they want to bring the museum to you today, tomorrow in your homes, on your computers. So this video will be available for the next two days. So to, please do um, register you, your interest. And um, whilst it's free, we wouldn't mind asking for a donation for you to look at. So um, the museum have also said after watching the video, um, they would also like you respond to the museum and um, make a comment on how you would like to see the museum in the current um, nursing world, what, what would really make a difference to you? How, how can we bring this more, more alive to you? And I guess now's a, an important time to make that change. If you like the music at the, that started playing at the beginning of the conference, then um, do look out for Duo's music. Um, they are just about to release some singles and an album in February. And Duo have kindly um, offered to give us some of their proceeds to the Florence Nightingale Museum. The conference is for you. Um, we will be using a, a question and answer session um, on, on the Zoom um, section, and we would like you to post any questions, comments for the panel sessions. All the panelists will stay on after the session and will try to respond to as many of your questions as possible. So we hope this two day conference will go some way to thank you, the nurses and midwives everywhere. On behalf of the Florence Nightingale Foundation, I want to thank you for everything that you do every day. Um, I am so proud to be a nurse right now. And I just want to say, never stop trying to be the best nurse or midwife you can. Florence Nightingale said, unless we're making progress in our nursing every year, every month, every week, take my word for it, we are going back. So I think you can agree that she taught the world a lesson that cannot be unlearned. And for certain, we are her legacy today. So thank you and enjoy the conference. So um, without me chattering on any further, I'd like to introduce you to Dame Christine Beasley of the Burdett Trust for, Fun for Nursing, one of our generous sponsors. Dame Christine has had an illustrious nursing career spanning over 60 years. She began her training in 1962 at the Royal London Hospital, where she worked as a staff nurse. And over her career, she's had many senior nursing roles um, in England. Her final nursing role was the Chief Nursing Officer for England. So this is the top nurse's job in this country. And she held that post between 2004 and 2012. And in 20, 2008, she was made a Dame of the British Empire by the Queen for her service to public, uh, public service and, and voluntary work. So Dame Christine continues to champion nursing. She's a trustee of the Burdett Trust for Nursing and chair of the Florence Nightingale Museum. She's also a fellow of the Queen's Nursing Institute. Dame Chris Christine, I welcome you and thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you, Greta. Look, good morning, everybody. And um, 
from here in the UK and a special good morning, good evening, good afternoon for those of you that are up, that are up early or, or, or staying up late. Can I add my welcome to you all, um, to Greta's? It's uh, great to have so many of you online joining us for this conference. As Greta said, three years ago when we were planning this event, we hadn't anticipated that we would be that we had anticipated that we would be meeting in person rather than virtually. But as nurses and midwives, we've learned how to be resourceful. So rather than just cancelling the event, here we are connecting across countries for, for what I know will be a dynamic, informative, and a fun two days. When my now grown-up children were small, they had a very favourite book, and it was called What Hat Shall I Wear Today? And it featured a little animal that every day chose a different hat, sometimes two, and the, the, the resulting adventures that they went into, a repetitive children's story that they loved. Well, I'm here today with three hats, not real hats, but three virtual hats on, uh, as a nurse, as a trustee of the Burdett Trust, and chairman of the Florence Nightingale Museum. So firstly, and above all, I'm delighted to be with you as a nurse for over 60 years, as uh, Greta has pointed out. So whether like me, you've been nursing for a very long time, or you've just started your career, we all owe an immense amount to those that went before us. These next two days are definitely not just about looking back, but it's always helpful to recognize our past and use that learning as a springboard so we too can leave a legacy for future nurses and midwives. I suspect you'll find a lot of speakers today mentioning Florence because after all, um, that's the name of the conference and she has made such an impact on our profession. So just a few words from me about Florence Nightingale. She undoubtedly transformed nursing into a respectable profession for women, helping to form the bedrock for our modern nursing uh, profession that we have today. Clearly over the years, the profession has evolved and developed to a place where now it includes men, women, nurses and midwives from a range of backgrounds and traditions. And although some of the images that are used to represent Florence they can sometimes feel outdated. So much of who she was and what she did is relevant today. And Greta um, mentioned some of those in her talk earlier on. She established 160 years ago, uh, the first professional training school for nurses at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. And vigilance and care for her patients were at the heart of all that she did and taught. But she added to that the power of data and graphics to provide the evidence to make fundamental changes to practice and to how care was delivered and to gain the resources she needed to make it happen. As Greta says, she was persistent, um, she was um, informative uh, and uh, she wasn't frightened of knocking on as many doors as she needed to to make things happen to improve the lot of the people she was caring for. If she were alive today, she would have been at the heart of fighting our current pandemic, challenging policymakers, fighting for resources, supporting and championing the nurses' contribution to their patients and the communities in which they live. She showed in similar difficult circumstances how to lead and to achieve lasting results and changes, a role model for what we see in some of our global nurse leaders today. So my second hat, um, as Secretary said, I'm a trustee and chairman of the Grants Committee at the Burdett Trust. The Trust is um, delighted to fund and support the Florence Nightingale Foundation in making this conference a reality. We've been partners right from the beginning and we're delighted that after all the time and all the ups and downs that we've all gone through, here we are today. Uh, and that says an awful lot about the Florence Nightingale Foundation and their complete commitment to making this happen. So just a little about the Burdett Trust for Nursing. It's an independent charity set up in 2002, named after Sir Henry Burdett, who founded the Royal National Pension Fund for Nurses in the early 20th century. 
The newly constituted Badet Trust reflects the values of its parent charity by making charitable grants to support the nursing contribution to healthcare. Our focus is in three areas. We're about building research capacity and capability, developing and strengthening nurse leadership, and supporting local nurses and their initiatives. And we do this by providing small and large grants to nurses and midwives as they lead projects, which are often multidisciplinary, uh, but they lead the project both here in the UK and globally. Over the last few years, our large grants have supported nurse-led multidisciplinary teams to deliver innovation in maternity and child health, dementia care, mental health, learning disabilities, prison care, primary care, and tackling obesity, not just in our patients, but also in our staff. That's just a flavor of some of our large grant programs. We also support individual nurses with much smaller local projects, both here and in the UK and internationally. Just a few examples to demonstrate what happens when nurses and midwives take the lead and are supported. So one of our, two or three years ago, uh, one of our hospitals, a team of nurses there, delivered a training film and an educational package to raise dementia awareness. It was a training package that they wanted to deliver to every member of the staff in the hospital, whether it was a porter, a secretary, a consultant, the chief executive, a nurse, whoever worked in the hospital uh, and in some parts of their community. Uh, and all, as part of this training package, all staff were challenged to make one improvement in what they did every day to make sure that people that had dementia uh, found the services easy and accessible. Their training film was fantastic. It featured um, a, a proper actor who acted the part of Barbara and it became known as Barbara's Story. Starting with that small group of nurses keen to make that difference. Um, that story has been supported by our Department of Health here in the UK. The training packages is, has been distributed nationally and internationally. And a couple of years ago, the then Prime Minister and the Cabinet had a training session themselves in Downing Street using that package. A real example of how a small idea can go national, international and even to the heart of government. And it is still making a contribution to dementia care. In quite another setting, in a prison down in the west of our country here in England, uh, there was a nurse prison officer there who was very concerned about some of the long stay patients who were now developing um, terminal illness, had no chance of being released and their palliative care was poor because of what they could do in prisons. So she took it on her own behalf to go and make contact with a local hospice and together they devised a care plan for these prisoners and indeed these patients they managed to talk the governor into supporting it, because as you can imagine, there are lots and lots of rules in prisons about what you can do and what you can't do. One of their early prisoner stroke patients who was dying for the first time, it felt like forever, was able to have a member of his family with him for quite a while as he was dying. That programme has been um, picked up and is being rolled out and used in many prisons across the country. Another example about nurses using their initiatives, seeking partnerships, not just saying it's too difficult, we can't make a difference, making such a difference in that very, very difficult area of care. And then if you like, right at the other end of the, uh, of the scope, um, a nurse accessing one of our small grants um, used that money to develop a training programme that was really suitable for um, pregnant women in small villages and rural areas in Africa, helping to raise their awareness about the issues they need to deal with, giving them some control over their health of themselves and their babies, and making a real difference uh, to the outcomes of their pregnancy for both mothers and babies. So we've really seen what an impact a nurse and a midwife with either a small amount of money or a slightly larger grant can achieve. The results have been remarkable. 
If you're interested in more about the Vedette Trust, do visit our website to learn more. This conference program, as you can see, will help us all explore the latest research, hear from exceptional nurse leaders, and learn from colleagues how they are making a difference in their own area of practice. As I said at the beginning, the Verdet Trust is especially pleased to be part of this endeavour. So my final hat, uh, as Greta said, I'm chairman of the France Nightingale Museum based at St Thomas's Hospital in London. Um, it houses a wide range of uh, collection related to France Nightingale, and it also honours other nurse leaders, such as Mary Seacole. You've already seen the little glimpse of it in Greta's slides. Um, but in today's world, museums are not just about the past, but are strongly rooted in the present and future. At the museum, we have a strong digital offering and a vibrant interactive teaching programme for school children. Evidence suggests that even in the 21st century, children can make decisions about their future at a very young age. Uh, so we're keen to get them young and explain to them what a great uh, profession nursing is. So they don't just learn about France, but they learn about what it means to be a nurse today and the variety that there is in nursing. I think people forget sometimes if they're not involved in the profession, what a great depth and breadth there is to the nursing and midwifery profession. So, as Greta said, whilst you're attending the conference, you can access a virtual tour of the museum, which I hope you will enjoy. Some of our collection will remind you not only of France Nightingale, the nurse, the statistician and the reformer, but as a woman who loved animals, collected shells and flowers and loved nature. And as Greta said at the beginning, as with many museums, it's very difficult at this time. We are based in central London and uh, we depend an awful lot on visitors and that is a very difficult thing to do at the moment. So we're deciding how best we contribute to nurses in the future to use this as a platform to say what next for us. And so as that slide suggests, if you have any ideas, we would love to hear from you. So in conclusion, I will return to the children's book I mentioned at the beginning. What hat shall I wear today? It ends with the poor little animal trying to wear all the hats at one time with the inevitable chaos that brought. Many of you will know what it's like to wear lots of hats at one time. As nurses and midwives, we are often very good at it. But too many hats at once, particularly over a long period of time, can bring stress and burnout. I hope these two days will give you a chance to put down some of your hats and enjoy not just listening to the debates, but join in, share ideas, help to build the legacy we all want to have and we all want to leave for those nurses and midwives who come after us and who will be able to share some of what we did when they're having another conference, perhaps in a hundred years time. I wish you all a great conference and I hope you enjoy all the participants and all the things that the France Nightingale Foundation have put together for these two days. Thank you. So, so thank you so much, Christine. That was incredible. A really great opportunity to, uh, for us to understand a bit, a, bit about, a bit more about the Burdett Trust, a bit more about the museum, but most, in, most importantly, all your hats that you, you carry so well and never one does, does one fall on the floor. So thank you very much, Dame Christine. Um, I'd now like to invite Professor Paul Crawford from the University of Nottingham. So um, Professor Paul Crawford is Professor of um, Health Humanities at the School of Health Sciences at the University of um, uh, Nottingham. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts um, and he's a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and Fellow of the Royal Society of Public Health. He is a founder of the new global and rapidly developing field of hu health humanities. Paul Crawford leads a large programme of research in applying the arts and humanities to inform and transform healthcare, health and well-being. And I'm absolutely delighted Paul is joining us this morning. When, when we asked Paul, and in fact Paul and his team have been involved in the foundation for, for a number of years when this idea came up, um, I instantly thought that's something I need to do. I also wanted to join the team and write another research proposal or a PhD, really asking to um, uh, 
to, to really wanting to be part of that team. So um, without further ado, I would like to ask Paul to present the keynote speak this, um, talk this morning. Um, and, um, and his talk is about Florence coming home. Hello everyone, and thank you Greta for uh, the lovely introduction. So my talk today is all about Florence Nightingale at home. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to add my thanks to the Burdett Trust for sponsoring this event and Florence Nightingale Foundation and its Academy for inviting me to give this address on the world's greatest nurse in the bicentenary of her birth in 1820. I'm also grateful to my research team at the University of Nottingham uh, for joining me in investigating the concepts and realities of home in the life and work of Nightingale, a project generously supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and by our many partners. Now, as Greta indicated, and also Christine, it's been a difficult year due to the pandemic. And it's great that we're able to meet up online from around the world. I'm speaking to you from home. And those of you not currently on duty in our hard pressed hospitals may be joining this conference from your homes. Now we've all been experiencing home in new and challenging ways. For some, this experience has been positive and even creative. For others, it has been physically, psychologically, and socially painful, if not tragic. Underlined by social distancing, coronavirus has disrupted what home is for us, can be for us, and the boundaries between home and work, home and society. It's worth reflecting for a moment just how engaged we've all been on Zoom or Teams to look behind our virtual colleagues, to see what lies in their bookcases, on the walls, or more dramatically perhaps, unexpected intrusions of family members or pets. Our fascination with the home-based identity of others has been emphasized. When we see people at home, or learn about others through family members, we gain a more colorful and enlivened sense of who they are. We get to see a little more of each other and perhaps even more than we would wish. Home is where we start and often complete our life journeys. It's where we enfold into our families when sick or needy. Home is the big story, and in our book, Florence Nightingale at Home, we try to bring readers into the ideas and realities of the homely and at times unhomely world of our great nursing leader. It's fitting that the cover of, cover of our book is a little known sketch of Florence Nightingale by her sister Parthenope at Lee Hurst her Derbyshire home, which is kept in good order by its current owners, Peter and Jenny Kay. Now our research on Florence Nightingale is the, the first investigation to study all of the 16 volume collection of Nightingale's writings made available to us in searchable form by Professor Lynn MacDonald. In addition, we were given generous access to the archive the family letters at Claydon House in Buckinghamshire. This was made possible by the Verney family and John and Pam Rivers, two of our citizen researchers. At Claydon, our team unearthed previously unpublished letters about Florence Nightingale that offer fresh new insights into her life and the formation of her ideas of health at home. For example, it became clear how Nightingale's young life was heavily governed and directed by her father, who made all kinds of demands upon her, not least in maintaining physical, cultural and spiritual health 
at home. He writes in a commanding way to his 15 year old daughter in 1835 as follows. Exercise for 10 minutes every day before breakfast. Before you dress, do exercise of the arms 20 times. In the course of the day, 20 minutes exercise must be done, and if not well done, 10 minutes more. Run down to the gate before breakfast by the road, or go down to the second gate upon the pony. Every day you must be an hour out of doors before dinner, unless you have permission to do otherwise. Never sit down to tea without changing. If not changed, it must be taken upstairs. Some new poetry to be learned and two things prepared for this evening. I always prefer varied poetry. Practice sacred music for half an hour. Pray never omit teaching Betsy on Sunday. If any of these things are omitted, you will work them up the next day. My goodness, I'm glad he wasn't my father. I'm sure you, you all feel the same. Now, although she was born in Florence, Italy, Nightingale's early life began at Lee Hurst in Derbyshire in the UK, at what became her family's idyllic summer residence. But in effect, she had many homes, notably the impressive Embley Park in Hampshire, but also her London residences, including the Burlington Hotel and South Street. You could say she was very experienced in the whole business of homes and households, something which lies at the heart of her work as a nursing pioneer and social reformer, advancing a robust nursing family and healthy homes at a time when public health was in its infancy. In our book, we attempt to close the gap between a monochrome nightingale, a rather distant national figure or icon, and offer a more intimate view through the lens of her domestic, emotional, cultural and spiritual life. We aim to pump blood into her, give her blood pressure, if you will, situating her in her time at her home, or should we say homes. The social foundation for Florence Nightingale's life of influence began at home with her wealthy family. Nightingale's father inherited a fortune from the rapidly growing industry along the Durban Valley near Matlock. In this context, she learned very early that home was a key site for people's health. Beyond her country house life, she witnessed at close quarters the poverty of families near her Derbyshire and Hampshire homes, choosing to visit the sick and helping when she could. She came to view the home as the seat of health, the place where the health of any nation begins and ends. As an early social reformer, she developed a commitment to improving the lives of the poor in their homes to advance public health. In the 1830s, her early visiting of homes of others less fortunate than herself underpinned her determination to improve the conditions of where they lived. She knew that better hygiene and ventilation could improve outcomes at times of contagion, a theme that is been all too apparent in many kinds of ways this year in the pandemic. Her developing recognition of the home as key to people's health inspired her work in sanitation, improving the care of people in institutions such as workhouses and alongside philanthropists such as William Rathbone, community services to improve health at home with the introduction of district nursing and health visiting. Nightingale wrote, when I go into a cottage, I long to stop there all day, to wash the children, relieve the mother, 
stay by the sick one. And behold, there are a hundred other families unhappy within half a mile. Florence Nightingale developed a strong sense that homes had to be carefully managed and administered to achieve health. Her concern to make homes healthy and the skills to do so unfolded into the ambitious trajectory to reform trainings for nursing, other allied work and public health initiatives. As we battle with coronavirus, so in her time, Nightingale faced outbreaks of contagion from flu to cholera. Indeed, aged 16, Nightingale experienced her religious call to service during an influenza outbreak in Hampshire. Like us currently, she lived under the palpable threat of infection. Mortality was an intimate, if unwanted, reality. She knew and drove changes to combat the unseen, dirty dangers lurking in our homes, hospitals, and elsewhere. She worked to drive death from people's thresholds, from the doors of their homes. Now, Nightingale's experience of life at home, like for many people, was not always happy. In the famous painting by William White, we see her posed alongside her sister Parthenope in the expected way for women of their class. They are captured, given over to books and embroidery, emblematic of the superficial peripheral skills and occupations considered appro appropriate for such women at the time. Nightingale railed against the preferred role of women. She resented domestic sterility, amusing and entertaining others, rather than developing her own path and ambition. She struggled with the idea of decorating the world of men and of marrying for security. Although her father had ensured an unusually deep and extensive education for her, Nightingale didn't want to sit around and fit in. She wanted to break out and do her own thing, be active in the world, basically to work. Although the Victorians celebrated the notion of home sweet home with the woman at the hearth, etc., home for Nightingale came to feel increasingly sour and psychologically confining. It became a prison marked by idleness and lost aspiration. Nightingale had an ambition beyond ornament and battled her family to work as a nurse. Given the poor moral reputation of nursing at the time, her family were opposed to this idea but eventually she got her way. In her short story, Cassandra, Nightingale presented her unease with how Victorian women were being held back from an active life, a life of work and deeper purpose. She wrote, women are taught from infancy upwards that it is wrong, ill-tempered and a misunderstanding of a woman's mission if they do not allow themselves willingly to be interrupted at all hours. In a very strong sense, work became Nightingale's home, where she found her identity. Indeed, her temporary residence at the Burlington Hotel in London came to be known as the Little War Office or the Little India Office, the latter referring to her efforts to advance sanitation in India. Working from home and work as home were to mark her future. Nightingale developed a strong sense that homely comforts were important to human health and recovery. During her time at Harley Street, she gave great attention to homely aspects such as the supply of good quality bedding, furniture, and food. 
She also encouraged the patients to feel more at home by coming out of their rooms, spending time in the communal drawing room and asking visitors to read to them. With the Crimean War in 1854, Nightingale got her chance to extend her homely experiences of care for wounded soldiers at Scutari Hospital in nearby Turkey. She used the administrative skills gained in helping to manage large households to good effect, bringing as much homely comfort as the logistics of the time allowed. Home comforts for men at the front such as pocket handkerchiefs, tobacco, pipes, shirts, stockings, mitts, and blankets were collected and sent to the Crimea. She even wrote letters of condolence and comfort to the families back home about their loved ones who died under her watch. Unfortunately, Nightingale's time looking after soldiers during the Crimean War came at a price, just as for many of our nurses during the pandemic, they have risked a great deal and shown great courage. Although undiagnosed at the time, whilst in the Crimea, Nightingale contracted brucellosis, most likely from unpasteurized milk. For much of the rest of her life, she suffered extensive bouts of pain and fatigue. Indeed, she achieved her greatest work from home and literally from her bed. There are several images of Nightingale recumbent on her chaise longue or tucked up in bed, famously in the Bozinke image of her at South Street in 1906. As many of us currently adjust to working from home, we may wish to reflect on just how productive this can be. Although Florence Nightingale is best remembered for the dramatic phase of her life during the Crimean War, from which she gained huge popularity on the back of newspaper reports of her efforts, much of her influential work came after these years and on her return to England she intermingled concepts of home and nursing in this work. Ultimately, Nighting Nightingale built on the long history of caring done by women at home down the centuries. This overlap between home and nursing is clear in her book, Notes on Nursing in 1859, which is all about the ways to keep homes healthy, as she emphasized in 1861. More sickness, poverty, mortality, and crime is due to the state of our poor men's dwellings than to any other cause. I would rather devote money to remedying this than to any institution. Florence Nightingale was also a deeply spiritual person who came to view home as a key site for religious devotion. Her own spiritual home lay in the Church of England, of which she was a member, but not without considering the value of other faiths or traditions, not least Roman Catholicism. As I noted earlier, her decision to devote herself to the care of others came from intense religious experiences in her early life. She viewed human care as a spiritual mission. Accordingly, wherever she lived, she looked to create what she called households of faith. She pursued spiritual enlightenment and religious devotion for herself and for those around her. As an invalid for much of her life after the Crimean War, Nightingale took the sacrament of communion at home with the support of her friend, the Reverend Benjamin Jowett. She diligently read devotional literature. She prayed privately, scrutinized the Bible, and even wrote sermons. Nightingale brought the spiritual and domestic worlds closely together in what Thomas Barry has called sacred 
domesticities. In a way, Nightingale became a self-appointed religious leader, a kind of virgin mother. Indeed, she took very seriously the influence that she could have as a kind of mother to the children of others, not least godchildren and her nurses. She wrote in a draft sermon, there can be no doubt for all history, all society shows it us, that there is a profound truth in the idea of the Virgin Mother. Since it is not people's own fathers and mothers who influence them most, almost generally for good. Indeed, some images of Nightingale portray her as a humbly dressed Virgin Mother figure and nothing like a woman brought up in the privileged world of country houses. This religious backdrop to Nightingale's caring work and her representation shouldn't surprise us. For centuries, religious orders had been key institutions in providing hospitality to visitors and strangers in need. Brought up in a Christian home, Florence Nightingale went on to learn how to nurse from her time in religious houses, such as <clears throat> at Kaiserswerth in Germany. In working to provide better facilities for nurse training, Nightingale aimed to replicate the mother house structure at Kaiserswerth, where an alternative spiritually grounded family could flourish. As you can see in a photograph of Nightingale surrounded by her nurses taken at Claydon House, and which featured in some of the earlier presentation slides, she was keen to be mother in chief to her nurses. In such images, she appears like a religious leader, an informal mother superior of her own quasi religious order, her own alternative family. Her determination for the motherly and homely extended to her efforts for nurses to have secure living environments, not simply as moral and upright spaces, but also increasingly comfortable spaces too, offering homely features such as sitting rooms and flowers that encouraged a sense of well-being and self-respect among their occupants. These twin notions of family and home also extended to Nightingale's approach to death. As with many Christians in Victorian England, she saw death as a going home a journey to the heavenly home. Like a ministering angel, Florence attended the bedsides of the sick and the dying and witnessed closely this ultimate transition, reporting on the quality of passing over to ease the minds of grieving relatives. In an 1889 letter to Shaw Smith on the death of his mother, Nightingale's aunt, May Smith, she writes, she went home to that home where she will be no stranger. Again, Nightingale on her mother's death in 1880 wrote simply, my dear mother is gone home. Fittingly, after a life dedicated to finding a spiritual home as much as an earthly one, on her death in 1910, Florence Nightingale was laid to rest in the family tomb at Wallow in Hampshire. This resting place is what we call a house tomb, resembling a church or house of God. Following her death and for the last 120 years, Florence Nightingale has achieved an enviable cultural afterlife. She has become an inspiring presence in homes worldwide, often as a figurine on mantelpieces, or even, as we find most recently, a Barbie doll. In the UK during the pandemic, new temporary hospitals were set up bearing her name. 
and there have been all kinds of merchandise featuring Nightingale, not least in household items such as cups, mugs and plates. Now, as much as Nightingale has invaded the homes of millions of people as commercial product, the importance she placed on homely, compassionate care has inspired generations of nurses. While keen to drive the science of care, the use of statistics to chart improvements, etc., Nightingale knew that judicious homely care was important. The comforts of home could help human recovery. For example, she saw the value of reading, art, music, and even coffee to uphold morale. In her later life, unable to appear at the bedside of dying friends and relatives, Nightingale would instead send provisions. For example, she sent a sick nun fresh eggs, jelly, beef juice, port and champagne on her deathbed. Now we all need friends like Nightingale who send us champagne at such times. I'm sure you will agree. So in summary, we see that the concepts and material realities of home played a central part in Florence Nightingale's life and work. I hope that you found this short talk of interest and that you will read our book, Florence Nightingale at Home, where I hope you'll find new and unexpected information on how she lived at home, worked from home, and the ways that home inspired her vision for health. Please do check out our website, florencenightingale.org. For all kinds of information relating to the project, including a virtual tour of her Derbyshire home and a digital version of our exhibition, Florence Nightingale Comes Home. I'd like to wish you all the very best during this difficult time. I hope that your reflections on the work of Florence Nightingale in this conference inspires new visions of what nursing can be. I hope that our nursing care is not simply effective, but also as homely as possible. I also hope that during any current or future lockdowns, however these are described, that your homes become sanctuaries, not prisons, sweet and not sour. Thank you for listening. Wow, Paul, thank you so much. Um, what you've managed to do in the short amount of time is you've painted the incredible picture of Florence from her childhood to her end of life, um, particularly with the emphasis of her home life, her household, the impact of her, her home on her future caring life. And we've all heard your amazing talk in our homes as we celebrate 200 years of Florence in this the year when we were all forced to work at home. Thank you so much, Paul. And I hope many of you will visit their website and um, buy this incredible book. Thank you once again, Paul. May I now introduce you to Dr. Gemma Stacey. Gemma is the my incredible director of the Florence Nightingale Foundation Academy. She comes from the University of, of Nottingham. Uh, her background is a mental health nurse. And this morning, she's going to um, chair the session on professional practice um, with an incredible lineup of, of panelists. You might, you might agree with me. Um, you, you'll notice in the program for the next two days, our, our sessions, um, our presentations, our panel sessions are themed under four tracks. And these haven't changed from the, the tracks we agreed almost um, Two, two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, and they feature professional practice, global health, digital health, and impact. So um, 
welcome Gemma thank you very much I'm, I'm very I'm very best wishes also to your your panel this morning thank you lovely thank you Greta so as you can see from the conference program we're due to take a break now and our break from 11 until half past is to enable you to view some of the pre-recorded presentations that Greta mentioned at the beginning of the conference opening so these are all available through a private link to a, our YouTube channel, which is only available to you as registrants on the conference. And um, we offer you time to peruse those 38 pre-recorded presentations coming from literally across the globe. So um, I believe that the link has been shared with you via email um, if you have registered for the conference. It's always also going to appear now in the chat function and we'll share a screen with that link on there. So we'll see you back here at 11.30 for our panel discussion. The first panel we have is focused around professional practice. And I have a real um, fabulous group of people to discuss with you and uh, the really uh, current and topical issues in relation to that, that focus um, for an hour from, from 11.30 till 12.30. So thank you very much and enjoy the pre-recorded presentations and, and also a cup of tea or coffee uh, to uh, relax and, and take a bit of a break. Thank you.